guys, welcome back to another tutorial. Today I'll be doing a breakdown of the Razor Black Widow, Razor Black Widow Chroma project. I'll be taking you through everything from start to finish. Not gonna rush it this time. This video will probably be about an hour long. Be a quite a long one, but I'm not gonna rush through anything. If you are a beginner, um, I'm not gonna explain everything. I'm not gonna go and rebuild the whole project. This thing took weeks to make. I'm just gonna go through the whole thing and just show you my processes. I'm gonna sh go through everything. Um, so if you're advanced, um, this might be a bit slow for you. I can't please everyone, but yeah. Um, if you like, you could like my Facebook page. I do post all my tutorials and renders and stuff on there. I engage with the Facebook community as well. Um, in the Octane Render community on Facebook as well. And if you want, you could also, so Facebook is more of a professional side of me. And then Instagram is more personal stuff. I do, I post on my Instagram stories. I do updates and just my everyday life there. I also do post my Instagram. I do post my renders on Instagram as well. And I also post like real life photos and stuff. So if you want to keep up to date to the latest stuff, you can go there. And if you want to download this project file, um, I've recently started a Patreon account. A lot of people have been wanting to get my projects, but obviously I'm not going to do all that um, and just give it all out free and then I'll start to get run into issues and stuff like that. So what I've done is I've um, set up a Patreon account um, at the moment. It is the 24th, 25th of August. Um, so on this date, it is $5 to download this project. And then I also have the BMW project and the Oreo project um, up on my Patreon account. And I believe I have another one. Um, so you'll get all the project files. The only thing I'm not including is the textures from polygon.com. I don't want to get sued. Um, I've purchased them, those textures from them. So I obviously can't resell them. Um, and I can't give them away. So the texture paths will be there if you have purchased those um, yourself, um, but the polygon textures don't come with it. But every, everything else comes um, with the project, the models, the textures um, that I've made. And then you, I haven't included the renders because those are gigabytes and file sizes and then that's just unnecessary upload and download um, for both of us. Um, so you can go re-render them out on your own. It's fully able to render and stuff. The only thing that's not included is, included is the polygon textures, but you'll get the After Effects files, the RealFlow files, the Premiere Pro files and Cinema Hoodie files all on patreon.com slash otherwhited. It'll all be there and it's $5 at the moment to get everything. Um, and then I'm also going to add on every single other project that I've made in the past. That's not commercial work. I'll add that on my Patreon account. So if you want to find that there, um, you can. So once again, uh, follow me on Facebook. If you want to get my more professional side and updates on my renders and my tutorials and stuff like that. And then if you want more personal side and you want just like everyday updates and sort of know when my next tutorials will be and stuff like that, you can go on Instagram and follow me, um, at, Arthur visuals on Instagram and you can get that stuff there. And if you want these project files and other project files that I've had, you can go to patreon.com slash all the So we can get started with the tutorial now. Um, I've explained in my last tutorial, which is the Oreo breakdown that I usually start off with the music. Um, I actually don't have the older versions on this. This is the second time I'm doing this tutorial just to cut out all the, um, extra rambling. I did, <laughs> I did a lot more rambling in that one. Um, so I don't have the older versions, but I can go and explain, um, this project. I don't have to go through the older versions and stuff. So usually I start off with audio. So here you can see I have a clip, um, over here and it depends on the person and their own, um, process of making things. The difficult thing with making a 3d commercial, um, especially if you don't have director doing it for you is if you're, if you're making a film that's with real life footage, you sort of have your own limitations. You can't make an alien ship fall out the sky. Um, you, you sort of know, okay, I'm dealing with real world elements. I have to shoot it on a certain type of camera. Uh, I only have this sort of budget and stuff. You have your own limitations. With 3D, you can literally make anything you want. And without, and when you don't have limitations like that, it makes it so much more difficult. So, um, I'm not a person that's able to, well, I can come up with, um, super crazy ideas, but I'm not sure if I can make them myself. And I also don't know how long it'll take and if it'll be too much. Um, it's just a lot, 
when you're trying to come up with a 3D commercial, um, there's a lot that you have to take into account. So what I do is I set limitations on myself so that it makes it a lot easier. What I usually do is I make, um, I take a song that's not the best because I'll be searching for hours for that. Um, probably will never find it and not the worst just so that it's enough that I'm motivated to finish it. Um, and then I also just cut it up into around 30 second to a minute video. So here I'm just setting up like limitations for myself. If I just have the super crazy ideas um, with no time limitations, none of that, I'll probably never ever finish the project and I'll probably waste a lot of time on things that um, that have no point in doing them. So what I'm trying to, what I've been trying to practice is creating commercials and just the whole process of creating commercials. I haven't been trying to make anything too epic or anything like that because I knew I just don't have the skill sets for that yet. If I, I, I want to make, I want to get the skill set of um, making a commercial, the whole process of it down first, and then I can go and sort of play with fancy stuff like that. So. I usually take a song, explain that, then I put a time limit on it. So here we have something that's around 30 seconds to, to a minute long. If I just change this, it's around 45 seconds long, um, right in between. And it's not something that's amazing and it's not something that's bad either. It's just in the middle. Um, so what I've actually done is I've taken the front of the song and then I've taken the end of the song here and then I've sort of um, cut them together. So this is the start of the song and then this is the end of the song over here. And then I just cut them together so that um, it has a seamless ending over here. So you won't actually no notice that this cuts there um, just because I've uh, edited it well, but this is the start and the end of the song and this is where the cut is in the middle. So here I might've Maybe it sounded like I've made an edit or something to make it sound like that, but that's just clever editing for me. I'm um, clever cutting there. So and then here, if I keep this constant power here, it fades out, but if I take it away, then you'll notice there's a cut there. So yeah, so that's pretty much the audio side. And once you have the audio down, now you can build the video around the audio. I like going that, I like taking that route. Um, I find it a lot easier and a lot better when you're editing and building the video around the audio because then you can sort of um, make something that's more visually pleasing if it's working with the audio than just a random audio track that has nothing, doesn't relate to the video at all. Um, so what I usually do is I call, I create these things I like to call time blocks or timing placements, whatever you want to name it yourself. Um, it's just a background or a mat which I place in the scene and then I sort of figure out where I want all the cuts to be in the video. Um, so I listen to the song and I'll think, hey, this will be a good cut, this will be a good cut. And then once I have all of those out, um, then I'll know, okay, I have so many scenes that I need to make um, and I know the length of them because if I go here, let's just change this to frames. I'll know, okay, this scene needs to be 24 frames, so I can go into Cinema 4D, create a new scene, make it 24 frames, insert it in here. I know this scene needs to be um, 13 frames, this one needs to be 23 frames, etc., etc., etc. Then I'll know, okay, now I have 24 animatics. Um, I call them animatics and stuff. I just call, I, I name these things myself because um, there aren't really any names for them. Um, animatics, which are basically just different scenes um, with animations and stuff in them. Um, so now I'll have all of those, um, make new scene, uh, make a bunch of animatics, place them all in here. Um, just random different animations. I don't really worry about the animations too much. Don't make it too complicated. Um, then I'll know, I'll get a, uh, a general idea of what the video looks like. Then I can say, okay, this would look better here. I can sort of reorder them, shift them around. And then once that, once I'm happy with that, then I can start like changing the animations, making them a bit more fancy. Um, and obviously um, here I, I know once, once I, if I don't like this clip, I can just go into Cinema 4D. Let's say this clip is um, this one, which is this one of here, Animatic 7. Um, all I need to do is go here, Animatic 7, then I have the Cinema 4D file and there it is. 
and then here I can go and change this. I can rotate this thing. Um, and generally I'll have a live preview of a Cinema 4D file here. And then once I save it here, it'll update in here. I can save it here and then I'll update in here and then I can look at it and I'll get a live preview of it. So, um, that's just generally my process of the whole thing. And then, then you'll have a very rough look at what your whole video will look like. Um, so then you can start refining your animations, uh, making them look a little bit better. Then you can start doing like rough renders of them all. Um, then you can start adding on post effects, um, adding in text and stuff like this, and adding in outro text and stuff like that. Then once you get a good idea and you think, okay, I'm very very high chances i'm not going to change this you can start doing full renders then maybe there's like one or two scenes which you want to slightly change and then you can do more full renders um again and then you'll end up with something like this so that's just just my that's just my general process of making a commercial at the moment um obviously i've been learning a lot and things change all the time so it could change tomorrow you never know but that's just been my process up to this point so um now that's my general process now we can start getting into the whole scene files and all that fancy stuff and just showing you what this how i built the scene from the ground up so um i actually made a razor video again that was for my portfolio probably end of last year uh end of december and i decided to remake it because i knew um it wasn't a tough thing to do and i could add a lot of improvements on it so i decided to do that um Thought that was just a good port next portfolio piece to do. So what I did is I remodeled the keyboard. I have I actually have this keyboard which broke. <laughs> it broke itself after like two years of using it, which is very disappointing. All my Razer gear just falls up, fell apart after like two years of using it. So they don't last. Um, so it's just been sitting there, and I decided to use it for actual reference. Um, I remember I used to have a hole in the back here on the old video, but I've went and remodeled it in a hard surface model way. I've been learning a lot of modeling. I actually downloaded a modeling course called Hard Surface Modeling in Blender. Um, I've never used Blender in my life, but it's the same principles across all um, software. And I, ab I was able to model this out in a nice hard surface way. I don't have to have all those unnecessary subdivisions when you're going for subsurface modeling. Um, so I got a very nice low poly model which looks good here and then i went and took the look i went and made the logo and the way i did the logo is you just take uh you can google razors why is this what's this, this funny shading here um you can google razor logo uh, vector file you can download the eps eps file or or illustrator file um, you open it in an illustrator, you save it as an illustrator version 8 file, and then you import it in Cinema 4D, you'll get the vector lines here, um, or the paths, and then you just go and extrude them by adding them inside of an extrude, and then you'll get something like this. Um, you merge it all into one object, and then you have this, basically. And that's how I did the logo. And then, yeah, on top of that is this glass here. It's just the glass covering this thing. This is also very nicely uh very nicely modeled you can tell i spent a spent a good time um making the, refining this project here so here's the glass as well just very well good modeling on that and then obviously there's the keys i explained this in my last video let me just hide this camera here i explained this in my last razor breakdown but how i made the keys is you just take a plane um like this then like that, make it editable. Take these lines here, then you extrude it, you extrude it down like so. Then you do that. Then you want to make th you want to push this down a bit. Then you just add some loops here, like so, like so. You add it inside a smoothing, and then you, there you have your key basically. And then you obviously you just adjust it and stuff up to however you want your key to look and then since i had um since a lot of these the, the these faces here were just straight like here you can see it's just a straight line i didn't need a lot of the subdivisions so i ended up actually like going in and individually like removing the unnecessary ones um 
So here I'll just take like these, because it's a flat face, you don't need so many polygons. Um, if I didn't have <laughs> these keys duplicated everywhere, I wouldn't be doing this, but um, because I did, I just removed them like that. That's pretty much how I did the keys. Um, so that's the keys there. So that's pretty much the modeling. And then here I have a plane just for the floor. Um, and that's pretty much it on the modeling side of this project here. I also have um, a wire here in the back here, which is pretty basic as well, just a spline with an inside. Um, so that's for the wire. Um, and then what I also did for, for the key, um, so that's the keys. Then I also have keys backlight, which is basically the backlight textures that will be shining on the back of the board. The way I did that is I just took all the, all the top faces of the keys and then I deleted the rest of it. So then I ended up with something like this. It will probably look like something like this actually. It will look like something like, no. I'm wrong. But yeah, I just took all the top faces of the keys, I deleted the rest and then I ended up with this. And then I flipped it around and then um, made sure all the normals are facing the right way, like so. And then that I, I use that for the, um, just to, just as a objects for, for the backlight texturing, which I'll explain soon. And that's just pretty much all the modeling side of it. Um, all this is extra old stuff, which I don't actually need anymore. It's just saved versions of everything in case I want to go back and um, change things. So, um, yeah. So that's all the modeling of the project. Um, we can move on to texturing now. So in my original, my in the 2017 version of this project, the one I did last year, I <laughs> created a key texture for every single key. That took a long time. This time I went for a more pr practical approach. I was a bit smarter this time. So instead of creating a texture for every single key and having to animate them individually in Cinema 4D, what I did is I merged all of these keys into one object and then I created one texture for all the keys. And that way I had a lot less textures to make. And I also had a lot more um, creative control in terms of animating it. So here we'll just sort of the keys here. I went and created a UV map for this thing. Um, over here, like so. So here you'll see we have a UV map of all the keys. Um, if I go into this thing, where is it? There. Here you'll see I went and um, took all the UV maps and I outlined it. This is the wrong one. It should be, I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, anyways, it doesn't matter. Let's just use this one since it's easier to see. So. I went and took all the UV map, um, all the UV, all the UVs of the keys, and I outlined them. I went and exported this as a Photoshop file, and then inside of Photoshop, um, I would get something like this. Then what I went, I went and did is I typed out all the keys, which took a while, but it was well, I only had to do it once, so it was fine. And then I ended up with something like this. So all these are typed out individually, which means you can go and edit them if, if you want. So here I can change this to, oh, uh, sorry, it's freezing. I just got the 2017 version of Photoshop, so I haven't optimized this properly yet and it's a bit slow. Um, just delete that. If I want to go and change this key to V, I can change it or I can do whatever I want. Then I also went and custom made all these uh, icons and stuff like that. Um, I have a very long Photoshop background, so this is pretty easy to do. Um, and then that's pretty much it. So now I have um, a mask of all the keys, which I can use inside of After Effects and stuff. So now I have this mask. What I can do is I can go inside of After Effects here, and then I can import it into an After Effects file, which you'll see over here. And then, so here you'll see we have, um, let's not use this one, let's use this one. Here you'll see we have our mask, which is just our Photoshop file that we imported. And then, it's a better view, um, 25. So here's our mask. Um, and then what we did, what I did is I took a 
solid. I just imported it. Then I added some turbulence noise on top of it. Um, obviously played around with settings and stuff. And then I added a colorama to convert this black and white map into colors. And I only needed a few colors for it to uh, look good. I chose those colors carefully. And then I pre-composed this. And then I took my mask here and then I luma matted the colors composition, um, which is our turbulence. Um, luma matted it to our mask, which basically just masks out everything. And now this is under our keys. So here we have our turbulence going um, and it's just masked out with our keys and that's the animation. So here you have full control of, your anim of all the keys um, can literally change each key to to be what it, what you want it to be, um, and which is what I did. I wanted to emphasize that I could animate each key. So what I did is I I um, created a composition, and I just created some circles and turned them um, on and off in a sequence to match up with the music here, like so. So here they're just turning on and off, and I just did the same thing. I luma matted it to our actual mask here. Um, so here you'll see if I go and change this maybe to a screen and that here you'll see that they're turning um, they're just these circles that are turning on and off but because they're luma matted here um, this is what they end up looking like once your animation is done you go uh, add it to your render queue you render them out as a JPEG sequence um, then you go inside of Cinema 4D because all of this is UV mapped and stuff you don't have to worry about placing it and stuff like that um, inside of Cinema 4D you'll just um, create a new material and here I put it in the emission section obviously the lights so um, you, imp you import your the first image of your sequence and then you just make sure that this isn't actually um, an animated image. Um, so you go and change this to however long your sequence is. And that's it. So now you have an animated texture and you can literally, if you want to change it, just go into After Effects, change it to whatever you want, uh, re render it out again and um, import it inside of Cinema 40 or just click reload and then it'll update and then you'll get a live preview of the whole thing again. Here I went for 4K just because I felt like that was the perfect number to get the good enough quality. Um, so that's the, the the textures of the keys. And then for the backlight, here, um, all I, I don't have, since you actually, it's just a backlight, you don't need anything special. Um, so here you'll see that I'm using um, just circles here. Why is this taking so long? Here you'll see I'm just using circles here. So if I go inside of um, After Effects, here yeah, for the backlight, I just pretty much copy this, I copy pasted this turbulence layer here. And then I just, I just masked it out with circles instead of actual um, text. So that was also pretty simple to do. And then I just rendered this out and then did, did the same thing on a new texture for my backlight. And here I could go for, um, 124 resolution because it's, it's at the back of the keyboard. You can't see it. It doesn't need to be high resolution. Um, and that's pretty much it for those textures, for those textures. Um, so the rest of the keyboard here, let's just go and bring everything in. Now we can get onto the texturing of the keyboard. So Um, this is a bit tricky. <laughs> don't even know how I can explain all this because it's a lot of layers. It's nowhere near as many as layers I've done before, but it's still a tiny bit. So I'll just go through them one by one, I guess. So here, if I go and If we look at the scene here, um, I just have a body, I believe this is, yeah. So I have a body, which is basically the base layer of the keyboard, um, just the glossy material. And then what I did is I put some um, fingerprints inside of 
the roughness. If I do use textures that I haven't made myself, they'll be from polygon.com. So it's just a fingerprint um, texture map for the roughness and you'll see it's giving a nice effect, um, like greasy fingers. And I just layered a bunch of uh, bump maps on top of each other to get some slight scratches, some slight imperfections. Then I also added in a normal map um, of some dirt wipes here, again, for some imperfections. I put that and a dirt map, which is just a diff white diffuse. I put them inside of a mixed material and then mix those together. I layered some, some um, once again, I was layering some dirt on top of that. So here you can see there's the dirt taking effect. If you're a beginner in Octane Render, then, and you don't understand what I'm saying, you'll have to watch a lot of tutorials to, to understand, but it is a bit, intermediate the stuff I'm talking about right now but here you can just take a look at what my actual node editor looks like so here you'll see um, we have the body um, two bump maps uh, one roughness map one normal map and then layer those two inside of a octane mix material and here I have three different um, dirt maps um, all combined together um, to get this look here so it's pretty kind of basic actually if you're if you know what you're doing an octane render um it's pretty basic and that's pretty much it for all the texturing on the keyboard really and then here the floor you would think that the floor is just pure black but it's actually not if i can just stop freaking out with this camera here um if you try and take a look at a closer look at the floor here maybe where there's some light you actually see that I went, I was pretty careful with this floor as well. And you'll see that this floor texture isn't pure black. It's actually a really nice texture. It just sucks that most of the scene was so dark, you couldn't see it. Um, but this floor texture is actually quite layered as well in terms of detail, stuff like that. Um, just most of the scene was black, so you couldn't see it. Um, but I paid close attention to that as well. And that's pretty much it. Here the gloss is just a speculative material, 1.52 index um, with some fingerprints in the roughness. And then obviously the logo is just an emission texture. Um, so that's pretty much it for all the texturing. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And then the wire, you don't even need to worry about that. It's not even mostly shown, so who cares about that? Um, so that's texturing and modeling out the way. Lighting, here you can see I'm using three-point lighting. Um, we've got a room light at the back here, and then we have uh, two fill lights going on here. One of them's, in, well, a key light and a fill light. One of them I turned off just because it was showing in the final render, so I hid that away. You can see there's our key light and then a rim light, no, a rim light, a key light, and then a fill light here and just basic three-point lighting. Adjusted it to work with the scene um, and it gives a very nice final look in, in terms of rendering. So if I was looking down like this, you get some nice lighting on this end and on this end at an angle and then just a nice room here just so you can get, uh, just so that the shape of the actual thing is more defined. Maybe if I brought this actual wire back in, now you can see it um, even more, even more detail added into the scene. Um, but because of our camera angle, you couldn't see that. So I just took it out completely. So now we can get into our actual camera settings. So you can see here it's showing and that's why I removed the visibility here. So so now we're taking a look at our cameras here. I haven't, ooh, animation, I guess we can do that. Uh, animation is pretty basic. Um, this camera, most of the scene is just cameras moving position and rotating, nothing else really. Everything else stays still, keyboard lights, everything stays still, it's just the camera moving and rotating. So here, um, the camera's just moving back and forth, literally just the X, the X axis and slight rotation that's being animated. And that's pretty much it for most of the projects. The only project that um, 
has a slightly fancy animation is the dolly zoom one which well let's not open it that way if you see my previous projects i'll get sued because <laughs> commercial work there so let's not do that <laughs> uh don't save um where's the dolly zoom one it should be might be this one because this one usually takes yeah um there's, there's a lot of particles in this one even though you can't see it so animatic 14 is this one so the dolly zoom effect is actually quite an old trick in film and i decided it would look cool in in a 3d if i use it in 3d <laughs> What it's doing is you're changing the focal length while moving the camera. So here the focal length is going up, like so. And then here, if you take a look at the actual camera here, let's just look here. You can see the camera is just moving um, backwards slightly to compensate for the focal length. So um, what will happen if you change the focal length here and not move the camera is you'll see that the camera looks like it's moving forward. So what I had to do is move the camera backward as well. As well camera backwards as well so that it looks like the camera is staying in one place and then the focal then your whole perspective is being distorted which is a cool effect it's an old effect in film called the dolly zoom it's actually overused quite a lot but um, i haven't really seen it much in 3d renders so i thought i might as well try something new there and that's pretty much the only fancy thing in terms of animation the rest is just rotating and moving cameras so yeah um, so that's it for the animation. Get into actual camera now. Um, yeah, you can see, let's take a look. Um, here I went for f-stop eight. Generally the f-stops are pretty standard. Um, f-stop eight, 5.6, um, it's generally those two. And then I just turned off my bokeh roundness and went for side count of three. I decided to go for that for just artistic reasons. And then I also turned up my aperture edge to three, which gives a nice hollow look in, in the actual depth of field. And then I also have some motion blur going, just added a uh, ab uh, object tag to my, to my keyboard. And then I clicked enable um, the actual motion blur. And then I just gave it a shutter speed to a realistic camera um, shutter speed. And then that's pretty much it. Um, then you end up with something like this. Then also have some bloom going um, from the actual lights and stuff, which I thought would be cool. Just add a bit more blue light filling inside of the scene. So, so it's a bit more f fun. And then my render settings, pass tracing, blah, blah, blah. Same old stuff. Um, you also have some adaptive sampling and that's it for the render settings and all pretty much it then i went and exported it as 4k footage png 16 bit that's pretty much it for the camera settings and the render settings uh didn't really use multi-pass or anything like that so once that's rendered out i'll go and import it inside of after effects um, generally I'll take, I'll get a good preview of everything first before I do renders and stuff like that. So this is animatic 14, right? So, uh, usually what I will do is I'll import the actual cinema 4d file here. <clears throat> so yeah, I'll import the, sorry, <laughs> there's noise in the background. So I had to pause for a second, import the cinema 4d file. And then here you'll get a nice live preview, um, of what you've seen would look like. And here you can see, um, it's pretty snappy. Well, it's actually quite slow, to be honest. <laughs> it depends on your CPU. But um, usually if you just play this out, it'll like render out all the frames and you'll get a nice live preview. It's a lot quicker than actually rendering, rendering them out. Um, but once they're rendered out and I have them in here, I'll take this actual Cinema 4D file and I'll extract the scene data like so. Boom, there you get your lights and your cameras. And then now because I have my camera data, it'll influence the particles which I have composited on top of this. So here I actually have some particle systems going. I thought that'd be a fancy thing to add, some like small dust. So here if I change the size to maybe 100, 
and then let these things update this is yeah you can see how many particles I actually have in the scene um but it actually works well with the scene so maybe if i turn this count down to one here you can see how it's moving with the camera here because i all i needed to do was um actually take the symbol 4d camera and import it into after effects and now the focal length of the camera and everything's changing um, in sync with actual with actual cinema 4d files so it's very very realistic in terms of like composing it on top of each other so that worked really well um and let me just show you another example so let me undo this probably won't save this file so i don't need to worry about it but let me just undo it anyways um where's another file where it's more this one so let's turn up the sizes of these as well maybe 25 and then we can turn this up to 25 cool so here you can see if i solo this um it's moving in sync with the scene. It works very, very, very well. Um, you have, so now we have like a 3D space of particles, which is in sync. Um, it's matching with a Cinema 4D file. So it looks really um, good um, when it's composited over. The only thing that, um, that doesn't get, when I import the Cinema 4D, when I import the camera from Cinema 4D, the only data that's not recorded for some reason is in, for some reason is the the Z depth on the camera. So what I've had to do is um, actually animate the Z depth myself and correct that. Don't know why it's not recording the Z depth, but it's not. So here you'll see we have our camera. Um, it's moving and it's rotating. Um, so if I just imported this and didn't have the Z depth recorded myself, here you'd see where is this thing. Let me delete that. Here you'll see this is pretty much we will get. We'll get our rotation and we'll get our movement of our X and Y axis imported, but not the Z depth. So this is pretty much what we're getting. Um, so I had to um, record the Z depth myself, um, animate it myself, and just sort of get a, like, a visual look to see if I was going far enough with the Z depth. And now we have our camera actually moving through our 3D space of particles going here. And that's pretty much all I had to do in terms of my own animation with the camera. Then obviously I had to go and make sure that the scene scale was correct and then sort of adjust the depth of field settings and motion blur, stuff like that. And then once that's done, I went and created my own, um, what am I doing? Sorry, I'm getting confused here. I went and created my own um, actual particle here. Um, so here I went and, call, I went and made a composition called sprite and then I went and created uh, five variations of particles here just so I get some variations in my dust and then um, I just went and switched this to sprite and then I have variations with my dust here so that's pretty much it for that and then once that's um, on top of each other the scene's a bit offish but it was fine um but the scene's not exactly correct in terms of matching with the scene um but it was fine um i wanted it to look the way it was looking so it was fine so if i go and reset this back to where it was it was probably 15 and that was probably maybe 15 as well don't remember what the actual settings are um but that looked good in the in the final so that was good enough and then here you'll see if i maybe go bump this up to five and then turn the size up to 25. Here you can see we have the same concept going in all the scenes. This one's a lot more accurate. Um, and here you can feel the camera moving through a 3D space of particles. Um, and that just works so, so well. And uh, I've really been wanting to work with compositing. So this was, I was really happy with getting some 3D scene data working well between After Effects and Cinema 4D. So that's pretty much it for the dust compositing. Um, no color, no color correction, color grading. I actually haven't done that in a while. Um, in my videos, no, haven't really needed to. Um, it's mostly just um, pot particle physics going on in this one. But that's pretty much it. So once I'm happy with that, I'll just save this, go into Premiere Pro. It'll update, give me a live update here, and then I can get a live live preview of everything if I'm happy with it. Um, then I can go and render it out and then look at it. Maybe 
um, in the rendered version, I can start to notice like some um, errors and things I need to slightly fix. Then I can go and adjust them, render it out, and then repeat the process. And that's pretty much it. And then this is just text. No one needs to know how to do that. Um, but that's, I think that's all, to be honest. Yeah. That was surprisingly not that long, but I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, like I said, if you want the scene file, it's on uh, patreon.com slash Arthur Whitehead. I'll also be posting my everyday files, my graphic design files, After Effects files. Um, most, most of my files, the only things I can't include are commercial work files, obviously. Um, and then the only things that aren't included are textures which I've purchased, like polygon textures, because they'll sue me if I go and resell those. So um if you want the files there you can find them there if you have any problems with those things please do let me know i'll try and fix it and then if you want to keep up to date with me um facebook.com slash author visuals that's where i post my renders and my tutorials and i also engage with the octane community there as well and then if you want more real life stuff i'm also on instagram at author visuals and then here you can there you can see my renders as well. I take Instagram the most seriously, which is funny because it's the smallest account I have. <laughs> but there I that's there is more personal. Um, all the friends I have and stuff I know there. And then I also do post my renders and stuff I get. And then I also post my stories quite often, just updates and my general life things. I also give tips and stuff I get. And I've also been doing tutorial in there recently. So you can follow me on authorvisuals at Instagram.com. If you guys enjoyed, hope you. Um, Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good day. Um, subscribe and turn on that notification button if you want more. If you have any questions, I'm sure you will. Feel free to ask and I'll try and answer them. Have a good day and goodbye.